So uh, we were asked to come and share a message on how your faith integrates with the marketplace. We're doing a series on marketplace, and what we want to share with you is a little bit of our background. And uh, Raquel comes from a, uh, in the industry, she's done many different things, one of which in the marketplace, she was the president of the Business Networking International in the local area in Florida where we live. She was also the uh, PTA president in our school where our children went. This is a parent-teacher organization in the school that integrates parents and teachers into the school. She was the president of that PTA organization. Later after that, she went to the church and became a church staff member, volunteering at first and then becoming on the staff doing full-time ministry. And then following that, she came out of church staff, and she's going to share a little bit about how that looks in the marketplace, having been equipped for all the time throughout her every season in her life that that mattered and that has equipped her for the things that she's doing now. So a little bit about Raquel. My journey has taken me from uh, the military. I was a military man. I uh, came overseas, I fought in several wars, but uh, through it all, I was equipped through God's strength to be able to carry the message. And we're going to share a little bit of that with you today. Later, after the military, I went into the private sector, and then I also came on church staff. So together, we are ministers of the gospel. We specialize in marriage, as I mentioned earlier, and then uh, now I'm in security, private security for the school that we, uh, our children went to and attended, so I'm the director of security there. So we both have a, a wide range of experience, and many cases, you don't know which way God is turning you, but what you do know is he strengthened you for the season that you're in. So I'm going to let Raquel start here and uh, share the message. Good morning, ICC to Katangla. I wanted to make sure I said that right. Let me try that again. Good morning, ICC Katangla. Thank you. I get a little nervous when there's so many eyeballs staring at me, so that's kind of why I walk back and forth on the stage. I wasn't expecting Jonathan to tell about how we kind of stalked our kids, PTA, being the school security. But that was a way so we knew everything that was going on with them. They just didn't know it. The scripture says, train up a child in the way that you want them to go, that the Lord will have them go, and they will never depart from it. And as I am so honored, Jonathan and I both, to know your pastors, your senior pastors, Pastor William, Pastor Winnie, we come to know and love Wilfred, who, as he was trained up, it wasn't hard to parent and to have him as a part of our family. He fit right in because it was the same type of upbringing and background. So there was nothing that we needed to do. We had been praying for him because we had been asked um, to lead in that um, area of international students who were coming and we'd had some students they just didn't work out so well so when Wilfred came that was we knew that together we had been praying and so thank you Wilfred for making it easy and thank you to your family we um, had an opportunity to just speak to Winfrey and we just knew we're like well one day We'll have her come and visit us, but now we're here, so you owe us. Thank you so much for having us. I mean, your senior pastors have the biggest hearts. They are the most humble people that we have ever met um, on this planet. Yes. At the age of 14, I accepted Jesus. But I never understood my assignment until I was married. And as Jonathan said, I was involved in a lot of things because I believe that's what I was supposed to do. I believe that 
as long as I was learning to be a wife and a mom, that God would equip me. But I kind of wanted him to let me just figure it out on my own. Anybody ever just figure they got it all together? I did. I figured that I just knew everything to do until you hit those hard times. And I was sitting here listening to this amazing worship team that you have, these men talking about, you know, um, God brought you through it. And he did, and he continued to do that. And he brings us through things over and over and over again. Because as we are parents, we have to turn and look at ourselves as we look at our kids and we go, how many parents have ever said, how many times have I told you not to do that? Yeah. Our father tells us that too. How many times have I told you? And we just continue to ignore it and it becomes obedience. We don't see it as that because we're adults. But to our children, when they're not listening and following, we're saying you're being disobedient. I spent 20 years in church ministry, volunteering, and then later becoming a part of the church staff because that's what I thought that I was supposed to do. I served in children's ministry. I was on the prayer team, the discipleship team, and I worked during the week in our marriage and family ministry as a counselor. I enjoyed the work that I was doing. I was excited because God had called me to do it. And I remember praying in 1 Corinthians 7, 17. And that scripture says, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. This became my prayer. And I remember praying one morning after I had said that prayer, and God said, leave the church. And I said, I know God did not just tell me to leave this church. And then he said, leave the church staff. Now, I wouldn't know it for a long time, but I had my hands in a lot of things. And sometimes God can't use us the way that he needs to use us because we're touching everything. And it was just because I thought that's what I was supposed to be doing. I was asked to help do things. And, and I was very clear about what God had for me and what I was supposed to be doing. However, there's always a season, as the scripture says, there's always the season in which God calls us. And it may not be on that path. Anybody ever had a a moment when it said, God, when? Well, when is when we're obedient and when we step out of our way and allow God to move when he needs to. And as I heard God say, leave the church staff, I didn't quite understand what that meant, but I knew it had come from the Lord and I also knew that I needed to leave the church staff. Even though I didn't know what it was, I was still very confused. And I remember telling my very understanding, loving husband that I was ready to leave my job because that was what I did for work. And so I remember him hugging me and with a smile, he said, I believe that you have a very touching gift, and it's about touching people, and there are people outside of the church that will never come to the church building, and they will never hear about Jesus, and they need to. So if God is telling you to leave the the church staff, I think that you should look for another job. And I looked at my very loving husband, and I went, what will I do? Because for 20 years I had been serving in the church and now I'm on staff in the church. So I had been doing that. And, and my background for education was journalism. They have journalism. So newspaper, 
Anybody, they still have newspapers? No. So what am I going to do? Because now it's all about social media that I had to lean on my young kids to even ask what that was, but we didn't even allow them when some of this, when the first social media was coming out, it was very private. So we didn't allow our kids to be on social media without having to sign up and stalk them. Remember, I'm the stalker mom. That was me. So there was nothing that I felt that I could transition to. And I began praying and I accepted a secular job leading teams of people from all different backgrounds, all different races, ages, different beliefs, and from different faith. And it was hard. It was a challenge, and I didn't like it, and I was uncomfortable, and I began to doubt, and I began to question if God was really saying what I heard him say, even though I continue to pray about it. Anybody ever pray and then you take it back? Like you get the, you get it. It's like, I've told you as a parent, it's like I told you not to go and play in the street. And then you get hit by a car and then you realize why they said don't play in the street. Yeah, that was me. So very hard headed and I just remember sitting and saying, God, really? Like, really? This situation that I'm in right now at work is total chaos. It was bad. It was when I would walk into our break room, I would hear cuss words. I would hear bad language, gossip, lots of negativity, lots of everybody's business who's knowing who and who's dating who and who shouldn't be with who and all of that. And I did not enjoy it. And it was beginning to take a toll on me. And when that happens, it seeps into other areas of your life. And I had been working with Christ followers, you know, the Jesus people, those saints, the people who don't Cuss. They don't use bad language. They don't gossip. They were always positive. I mean, at least not in the church, right? You know those people. Because we all have sin that we bring, and it just looks very different. It's a different form, and sometimes we have this misconception that we are Christians, well, y'all know. So, God being the wonderful father, he is said, hard times don't last forever. And that's what he said to me. And I went, really? Really? Like, I'm having a full-out conversation in my prayer closet with God. Like, really, God? Like, did you hear? You, you want me to be able to listen to this? Because there were people who would walk up to me and, and I would be like, oh no, they're me. I'm like, oh no. You know? But never using that as a moment or an opportunity to share the gospel because I didn't want to be uncomfortable. And God said, yes, daughter, that's right. And as I'm sitting, reading my Bible, Ecclesiastes 3 1 is there and it says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens a time and a season and that's where i was and your time and your season may be uncomfortable and it may force you to speak to people who you wouldn't ordinarily speak to or smile at someone who has gossiped behind your back at you, or whatever it is. You see, God gives us an assignment that we think is bigger than we are capable of handling. And as the song says, he'll get us through it, right? 
And so we don't think of that until we're in the midst of all of the stuff. So we need to know, for me, coming from a journalism background, if any of you know, you got to get the story. You got to know the who, the what, the when, the where, and the how. And that's what I was saying to God. Who? Me? What? You want me to go where? Right? So having that, I needed to know, and I realized that God already had those details in place. He didn't need my help as much as I thought that he did. He already had the assignment, and he speaks to us without a lot of direction, but he always gives us the tools that we need to fulfill his assignment. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 tells us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. So, you know, I knew the scriptures. I prayed with people who were coming into the church saying the same thing that God was calling me to do. But I couldn't see it because there was rarely that I sat on that side. Most of the time I'm on this side um, of the congregation at the prayer, at the, the prayer altar and listening to those prayers and intercessing for the people who were believing for something else, but never for myself. I always felt like God needed my help because I was different. But as a believer, I know I have a responsibility to be obedient to God's calling. And remember, I said God called me to help hurting people. And so the church although we know that there are people that are hurting, but the hurting people who don't have the opportunity to see what God does and how lives are transformed and how people are healed, they're not in this church. They're not on the walls of this room. They're not going to step inside of this church or any other church to hear the message until they have been given that opportunity until we, you, invite the person in your marketplace who is gossiping, who is a big cusser, bad language, all the business out. Our obedience as a believer is to help those people from the different backgrounds, different races, different ages, the old, the young, the cussers, the bad language users, the gossipers, all the ones who speak negativity. Every day we should be looking for opportunities to help those who need to hear what God has done for you, or even a friend for you, or even, and I just remember praying every day for God to use me. I look for opportunities, and I ask him to help me. I recognize that the person who may walk into my office as I've packed up everything may be that person that God has sent for me to speak to. I recognize when I'm on my way, and I'm praying and believing for those who don't know Christ in my marketplace. It's still not easy. But we know that great things are never easy, right? We know what it took for Christ to die for each and every one of us for our sins. And so we have a responsibility to help others. My team members see how much I love the Lord. And one of the things that I get asked is, you know, how... How do you do it when you just don't know what to say? It's your character, the way you show up, the way you walk into work. It's just a smile, a hello, 
No one should ever know that it's a struggle to just hold your head up and smile because you lived another day. But there is someone else who needs to understand that. And that's how we express. We show up because God is on, over us. He's upon us. And we're always surrounded. And so I do have people who will ask about stories. There's non-believers who um, they don't believe Jesus. But I make it a point to say, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. You know, and they don't really understand what that means, but we continue to pray for those people because they don't know what they don't know. So this always makes me excited, and I take the time to pray to be more like Jesus. And as we know, Jesus didn't walk around going, oh, my gosh, somebody's going to betray me. I don't know what to do. This is going to be bad. He didn't do that. He continued to be in the ministry. He continued to love those around him, even though he knew what was to come. And so even though we know that we're having a bad day, we're choosing to not share that. We're choosing, and sometimes people decide, well, you know what, this is just a little problem. But God tells us that no problem is too big or too small for him. And so we, we need to be able to help others recognize that. He asks us to give of our tithe, our talents, and our treasures. And one may say, well, I don't have anything to give. We all have something to give, but we have to think beyond money when someone's in need. Sometimes it's just a prayer. Sometimes it's just sitting with the person, holding their hand, giving them a smile, just a little bit of our time that we take out to be able to share that with, um, with what God has given us. So I'm happy to tell you that today I understand my who, my what, my when, my where, and my how. I get it. And God answered my prayers He's given me and you the responsibility as Christ followers and believers to share our faith wherever we're planted. It doesn't matter where you work. It doesn't matter if you are at the grocery store just being out. We should always, always take the opportunity to help someone else know the face of Jesus through our hearts, through our sharing, and through the love if it's just a smile. Thank you. Raquel and I both knew that we are on the front lines of spiritual battle. We were on the church staff for a number of years. We existed and we were equipped by being in the church staff, we went and uh, graduated from the Biblical School of Leadership. It was a 15-month uh, master's level uh, education program of instruction, and we became pastors and ministers through that organization and through that church program. But at some point, what we realized is that we're equipped for the battlefield. We're equipped for the front lines. Being in the Marines, I know what it's like to be on the front lines. Uh, we, we welcome the action. We know the Bible tells us very clearly that the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And what we realize is that Raquel and I both are equipped for the front lines of battle. So that's the reason why we came and were called out of the church staff. And for those of you that are on the church staff, we love you so much because you are the one that gives the meat to the house of the Lord. You're the, you're the one that equips each one of us, the congregation, for the mission field. There's a purpose for every one of us. And what I'm asking you today is look inside the purpose that God has given you and the season that he's put you in, where he's planted you. 
If you're in the church and you're a congregation member, but your marketplace uh, uh, assignment is a, a banker or in construction or in security like I am or a business owner, whatever it, season you're in right now, recognize that you are on the front lines of battle. Your assignment is precisely where God has you right now. I love the way God describes his relationship with the church. He is the groom and we are the bride. We are the church. So we are Jesus's bride. The relationship that he describes is so fitting because he wants every one of us to be in relationship to him. He loves us just like the, he loves his bride. We are his church. And one of the things I want to share with you is something that a, a mentor, counselor, pastor of mine shared with me. And it may, it's going to start out a little abstract, but follow, stay with me. The way God looks at your life is the comparison between how many jazz, uh, how many jazz uh, people do we have in the house? Anybody like jazz? Jazz music? Love jazz music. Any of you who like jazz music know that jazz music in its purest form is never played the same way twice. It feeds off of each other. Each instrument feeds off of another. Each beat and rhythm feeds off of another. And isn't that like life? You don't lay your life out in perfect order. You feed off of uh, moments. You feed off of people. You feed off of victories. You feed off of defeats, setbacks, uh, periods in your life. So that's... As we go through life, life feels like a jazz piece, a jazz music that you're feeding off of these things and you're just kind of bumping around and finding that your life isn't the way you laid it out. So then I want to introduce symphony orchestra. Symphony orchestra music is played the same way every single time. Perfect, perfect harmony, perfect rhythm. That's the way God has laid out every one of our lives. And we don't see that because we're going through life like a jazz piece, feeding, not knowing what's next. When we look back, what we realize is that God laid each one of our steps, not as a jazz piece, but as a perfect symphony orchestra. And when you see that, you recognize well, I didn't get that job because I had someone else to minister to in my next assignment. I got this promotion so that I could be elevated to this next level. I got that rejection so I could go and be the hands and feet of Jesus to the people that are in my community. I was called away from that job to go and be someone else. Uh, that uh, minister to someone else. So what we recognize is that while you may not have your whole life all planned out, God does. And that is, I wanted to share that with you because that is the truest form of how we go through life. You see your life as, you know, bumps and bruises along the way, but God has perfectly laid that out uh, in, in perfect form. So I want to put a scripture up that I think is so fitting. It's what we call the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, and it starts in verse 16. Uh, it's called the Great Commission because there's a couple things as we peel apart this scripture that I want to point out. And I think that it's so fitting that when we look at this, we have God in Jesus who was about to leave, and he knew that he had time, uh, his time was short. He brought his disciples, and if we can have that up on the screen, I'll read it. Okay, it reads, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, 
to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now, I'm in the military. We understand orders and we obey orders. Jesus told his inner circle, these 11 discipleships, uh, disciples, to go, and they went. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Anybody ever doubt God? Of course, we all do. We doubt him because we worry. We doubt him in the form of uh, disbelief. We uh, don't recognize the assignment that he has for any one of us. Sometimes we do, but sometimes we don't. So they doubted. We're no different than his inner circle disciples. So when they doubted, what did he do? In verse 18, then Jesus recognized. He knows the past. He knows the present. He knows the future. So he recognized that his disciples had some worry, had some indecision. They, so he reassured them, as Jesus always does. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He reassured them of who he was and why he was there. And then I love what he does next. He tells them what to go do. He knew they were obedient. He reassured them. Now he's going to command them to go. So therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So verse 19 tells, he tells his disciples the same thing he's telling you and me to do. Go and make disciples. When we're in our workplaces, how do you go and make a disciple? You do what Jesus did. You meet them at their point of need. You find common ground. Part of your story it's very common to something in their story. When you're being discipled in your, wherever it may be, your testimony, your life story has some sort of common ground with somebody else. That's exactly what Jesus did. He met people at common ground. He met people to be able to relate to them. That's why he came to them from heaven. We couldn't relate to God the Father. We never saw him. God did, God the Father did something that I find just so fitting in the Old Testament. So many people fail God. And God the Father said something that many of you say when he's let down, when you're let down, when you're disappointed. If you want something done right, go do it yourself. So he formed himself into Jesus, and he came down to earth, and he did it right. Isn't that what we all say? If you want something done right, go do it yourself, and that's what he did. So he came down. He became relatable to every one of us. He met us at our point of need. Then finally, verse 20, and, and he's talking about go and make disciples of the nation. Go to who? Go to the people and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He tells us that he's equipping us for this battlefield. He tells us, he reassures us that he is the authority given to him in heaven. Think about that. Who is in heaven? God the Father. He is telling us that he is the authority. That's the Trinity at work here. So he reassures the disciples, tells them, give them a mission statement, and he tells them to go, just like he's telling you and I to go and be the church. I want you to say something with me as I get ready to wrap up and look at your neighbor and tell them, I am in the church right now. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. I am in the church right now. But I will be the church later. I am in the church now. But I will be the church later. And what does that mean? That means that you are the church. Every single one of us is the temple that God is talking about. We are the church. This is a church building, but just like Raquel said, we have to go out and disciple nations we have to go out and disciple and minister to people in our workplace environment. If you're a student, you 
have the community of students and fellow students with you. You are the church that needs to go to them. Jesus did not come down from heaven just to feed you in a church building. He got out of his way, came off of the throne to come down to, any, to every single one of us. I think we owe it to him to go and do the same thing. Get out of our comfort zone. Be the church in your marketplace, in your workplace environment. Listen to the assignment. Be reassured that he is with you all every step of the way. And don't doubt for one second that he has not equipped you for the time that you're in right now, for this moment, for the people that are in your circle.